In Thomas Paine's great book, Common Sense, Paine appeals to the authority of Scripture, despite the claims of today's idiotic Roman Catholics and atheists. copy of my theological journal, then send me an email to the email address that you see at the beginning of this video, and I'll send one out to you free of charge. The project to rewrite American history has been well underway throughout the 20th century and continues to this day. This project has been launched mainly by Roman Catholics, but also by some atheists. One part of American history each of these groups wish to rewrite is the history of the Founding Fathers. Rather than admit the Founding Fathers of the United States of America advocated Calvinist political thought, these groups attempt to fabricate a myth that the Founding Fathers were mainly deistic in their outlook. One common target of these Catholic and atheist spreaders of myth is Thomas Paine. They would have us all to believe that Thomas Paine urged the United States Revolution solely from a deistic basis. It is true that later in Thomas Paine's life, long after the U.S. Revolution was complete, he did openly attack Christianity while trumpeting his deism. However, during the American Revolution, in his most important book, Common Sense, Paine would carefully base his arguments for colonial independence loudly on the authority of the Bible, while keeping his deism well in its place. And this is the part of history you're not supposed to hear. If the student of history will simply read chapter 2 of Thomas Paine's Common Sense, then it at once becomes evident that Paine is loudly advocating Calvinist political thought. Let me read to you some of those words you're not supposed to hear in history class today. Blasting the political idea of government by monarchy, Thomas Paine writes the following, and I quote, As the exalting one man so greatly above the rest cannot be justified on the equal rights of nature, so neither can it be defended on the authority of Scripture. For the will of the Almighty, as declared by Gideon and the prophet Samuel, expressly disapproves of government by kings. All anti-monarchical parts of scripture have been smoothly glossed over in monarchical governments, but they undoubtedly merit the attention of countries which have their governments yet to form. Render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's is the scripture doctrine of courts, yet it is no support of monarchical government, for the Jews at, the, at that time were without a king and in a state of vassalage to the Romans. End quote. Common Sense, Chapter 2, Page 10. Thomas Paine here is appealing to the authority of the Old Testament, specifically the books of Samuel and Judges. Thomas Paine goes on, page after page, to appeal to the authority of Scripture. He writes the following, and I quote, These portions of Scripture are direct and positive. They admit of no equivocal construction. That the Almighty hath here entered his protest against monarchical government is true, or the Scripture is false. And a man has good reason to believe that there is as much as kingcraft as priestcraft in withholding the scripture from the public and popish courts. For monarchies in every instance is the popery of government." End quote. Common Sense, chapter 2, page 14. Did you catch Paine's assertion that if God's protest against government by monarchy is true, then the scripture is true? That doesn't sound like deism. Paine is appealing to his Calvinistic Protestant audience. For the overwhelming majority in the colonies were Calvinistic in their political thinking, especially after the Calvinist revival which swept through the colonies, also known as the Great Awakening, from 1730 to 1770. Next, notice how Paine connects government by monarchy with Catholicism. This is a page right out of the Calvinist political playbook. Calvinist Oliver Cromwell clearly held this view in England over a century before Paine ever drew a breath. All through the 1600s, John Locke, another major influence on the U.S. War for Independence, was also advocating the same Calvinist thinking in his political treatises. Locke came from a Calvinist home, both his parents were Puritans, and his father fought with Cromwell in the English Civil War in opposition to the King of England, Charles I. So we're not surprised when John Locke also appeals to the authority of Scripture 
in his two treatises of civil government. Before Oliver Cromwell and John Locke came along, there was the political writings of 16th century Scotch Calvinist George Buchanan. In his work, De Jure Regni, Buchanan lays out the same argument Jefferson used in the U.S. Declaration of Independence. You see, the ideas espoused by Jefferson during the American Revolution were nothing new to Calvinists. In fact, Jefferson learned his Calvinist political thought from his Puritan mentor Samuel Adams, father of the American Revolution. So getting back to George Buchanan in the late 1500s, he was arguing that a king was not a ruler by divine right, but by contract between himself and his subjects. Now should the king violate this contract to his subjects, then the king's subjects may resist him even with force. The point of tracing all this back to 16th century Calvinist Scotland is to show that the so-called deistic participants in the American Revolution drew their political thought from Calvinist thinkers. Consider one more passage from Thomas Paine. In his Rights of Man, he writes the following, and I quote, A constitution is a thing antecedent to a government, and a government is only the creature of a constitution. End quote. Rights of Man, page 66. What a Calvinistic remark from Thomas Paine! For he appeals only to a written document as the basis for defining and producing a government just as a Calvinist would only appeal to Scripture as a basis for defining and producing church. Such thinking is not the result of deism, but it is the logical result of the Protestant Reformation.